Well, hey, everybody, welcome back to the Dr. Jockers Functional Nutrition Podcast, where we look at lifestyle as biological information that helps, helps us control and express our genes, that literally our genetic expression is based on the food we eat, the air that we breathe, the water that we're drinking, and uh, the thoughts that we're thinking. And so we know that we have an impact on our health expression. And today we have got a great interview, really powerful healing story that I think many of you guys are gonna be inspired by, and uh, some really incredible information so I know you're going to love this. And so my guest is Allison Gannett, and she specializes in customized oncology nutrition. She herself had a metastatic brain cancer, right? So, um, and she actually used oncology nutrition to prevent and conquer her cancer. She also uses blood chemistry, lab testing, DNA profiling, and, and health history uh, when she's working with her clients. Her heart and soul goes into her work, and she's created a program called Conquer Cancer with Keto, Allison's 28-day DIY program video series. She also works with people one-on-one. She's a former world champion extreme skier and an award-winning climate change consultant. She and her husband grow and raise almost all their own food at the remote farm near Panoa, Colorado. So Allison, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. Absolutely. Well, you know, really interested in your story. And so I'd love to get started with that. Just um, what happened to you? Obviously, here you are, world champion skier, uh, heavily involved in climate change as an activist. And and uh, so what happened here? Well, I mean, it was a crazy story. In 2013, I started acting like kind of weird. I was having a hard time jumping off cliffs. And then one day I was cooking in my kitchen and I was watching a pan catch on fire and watching the flames go up to the ceiling. And my Mm -hmm. husband walked in and was like, what are you doing? And I was just thinking how pretty it was. And he was like, okay, something's wrong. You know, I had been acting very, very strangely, but this was kind of the icing on the cake. And so we rushed to the ER and I had a brain tumor that took up almost two thirds of the space in my brain. And it, it was hard to imagine that I was walking and talking and moving, let alone being alive. Yeah. And, uh, so they rushed me into emergency surgery got most of the tumor out. And luckily in my recovery phase, I found Dr. Nisha Winters and started embarking on a ketogenic and metabolic approach to um, you know, conquering the cancer, reversing the root causes. Obviously it's way more than just diet. Yeah. Um, but that was kind of the foundational premises was getting into ketosis. And Yeah. And so how long did it take you? Obviously, here you are now, you're in remission. So this is 2013, so roughly seven years later. How long did it take you to really see results symptomatic-wise? And then also, were you getting follow-up MRIs or CT scans or what sort of testing were you doing? Yeah, you know, it's ongoing work in progress. Um, Dr. Nation never even calls any of us in remission. It's kind of Like you're just, it's like layers of an onion. As soon as you peel one layer off, you find another layer and another layer and another layer. I'm still doing that. I still have uh, past um, pesticide and herbicide exposure. I've been eating Mm -hmm. organic for 15 years, growing and raising my own food, but I'm still dealing with these past chemical environmental toxins that are still in my body. But what was interesting in 2013, you know, I had been vegan, vegetarian, grown, growing all my own food on my farm, like even growing wheat and things like Mm -hmm. that, like exercising all the time, being outdoors. I mean, I thought I was a really healthy person. And then all of a sudden I was like this close to being dead. And then I find out that I have 6.8 months to live if I do surgery, chemo and radiation. And so I didn't want to just like kind of barely survive or, you know, really suffer through treatment. Luckily, my DNA profiling did not show that chemo or radiation would be very effective for my type of tumor. And so I decided to go on a full Dr. Nisha metabolic approach to cancer and reversing the root causes. It was very hard for me to switch from the diet that I was eating 
to like kind of embracing having two cups of fat a day, which, yeah. you know, I, I know most people can relate to. It seems even in college, I was taught in my nutrition classes, you know, to mist my salad with um, a spray mister of olive oil. I had been following the low fat paradigm. I had been exercising my brains out. I was still battling with my weight. And then all of a sudden I was told to eat two cups of fat, nine cups of organic vegetables, small amounts of grass fed, grass finished proteins, wild caught fish. It was a huge change. Yeah. And I didn't really have a choice because my diagnosis was so terminal. So I just figured I had nothing to lose. I might as well go for it changed everything because I track my blood work every month and I have been tracking my blood work every month for seven years. When my blood work came back one month into the program of changing the way I ate, um, I couldn't believe it. The markers immediately reversed themselves. Three months later, it was like a miracle. Six months later is when I really started to see changes on my scans. Um, it was at that point that things like my polycystic ovarian disease reversed itself. My seasonal allergies started to go away. My rheumatoid arthritis went away. Mm -hmm. um, my breast fibroids went away. I literally felt like the ketogenic diet was like snake oil. Yeah. And in a good way, though. Yeah, like, yeah. It just seemed impossible. <laughs> that all these conditions that I had throughout my life, um, I had chronic bladder infections and yeast infections, um, chronic um, bronchitis that I got every year, all of a sudden all this stuff went away. Doctors had been telling me for years that none of these things were reversible. So here I was um, thinking that I was healthy, but really becoming healthy. It took the C word, yeah. Um, to kind of realize that I needed to rip the tape off the check engine light. I think I had been in denial right. that yeah. I wasn't healthy. Yeah, absolutely. And what blood markers were you looking at? Oh boy. I look at about 70 different blood markers every mm -hmm. month. Um, I look at the CDC, mm -hmm. CMP, um, but then we're looking at what Dr. Nisha calls the trifecta, which is the sedimentation rate or ESR, lactate mm -hmm. dehydrogenase, mm -hmm. um, also HSCRP, marker of heart disease. Then, of course, we're looking at all the diabetes markers because most cancer cells are glycolytic. Yeah. Um, we're looking at other glycolytic pathways like IGF-1, um, uh, it, fasting insulin, Mm -hmm. uh, uric acid. Uh, then we're also looking at all the thyroid markers. Um, we're looking at all the stress markers like cortisol or um, uh, even carbon dioxide. Exhalation yeah. can tell us like how much stress is going on in the body. Um, I could list, you know, then we're looking at all the angiogenesis markers like copper, uh, fibrinogen, uh, VEGF. Um, it's a long list. Yeah, absolutely. And so you were obviously looking at all those. And I know that I talked to Dr. Nasha, you know, the, that trifecta that, like you're talking about, it's really looking at inflammation, the ESR, the uh, LDH, the lactose dehydrogenase, and the high sensitivity C-reactive protein. Right. So those are easy tests that, you know, most people are listening can just get done at your doctor's office, right along with your complete blood count and everything, kind of see where you're at as far as on an inflammation level. So... So this is obviously an incredible story and you started reducing the tumor and what inspired you to obviously now coach people because now that's what you're doing. Well, you know, I, I just kept finding myself getting healthier and healthier mm -hmm. and all the doctors were amazed. They couldn't believe that it was actually happening. And I think in the beginning I was so fearful and I was, told that I was going to die. I wanted to believe that this approach would work. And slowly, I really started to believe that. And then, you know, the lab supported itself. Um, I, you know, was working also with viruses. I have a lot of virus issues, heavy metal poisoning, um, immune system imbalances, gut imbalances. I didn't mention those before. Yeah. Um, watching all this stuff change just made me realize, you know, we can reverse not only 
cancer. We can prevent cancer too, but looking at all the other diseases that Western medicine just considers as like normal, that you're gonna get diabetes, you're gonna get heart disease, you know, we have no cure for Alzheimer's or ALS or Parkinson's. And I started going to all these conferences and then I started studying with Dr. Nisha. I did a full year program with her and then I apprenticed with her. Then I did the American Nutrition Association Certified Ketogenic Specialist Program. I just wanted to help everybody. I wanted to shout to the world that, yeah. like, hey, we can not only be healthier people, but we can take control of our destiny. Mm -hmm. When you're given a cancer diagnosis like mine, you feel tiny. You feel powerless. You just feel like you're at the mercy of when's the next scam going to come and am I going to find out that it's coming back? Whereas this flips that whole paradigm around where I look at my blood work, I know exactly what's going on. And when I teach my clients how to look at their blood work and mm -hmm. their DNA, all of a sudden we're in the driver's seat of our health. Yeah. And I wanted to just scream to the rooftops to everybody, as I'm sure you do too, mm -hmm. that, you know, we can use, don't wait until you get cancer to make changes in your life. Um, there were a lot of signs that I needed to change things. Yeah. Um, but unfortunately, it took me getting terminal cancer to make a difference. Yeah, absolutely. And what do you think were the main factors? You've touched on some of them that contributed to all the different health issues that you were having, obviously, then also the, the brain tumor. Yeah, you know, Dr. Nisha talks about the terrain 10, the 10 yeah. different factors that go into that. I think for me, sugar and carbohydrate uh, metabolism was a big problem. And when I look at my DNA, uh, I use um, nutrition genome. Mm -hmm. um, I have a lot of issues with metabolizing different types of sugar and also grains. I, I basically was born without the ability to process grains. I had because of that, probably massive problems with my thyroid. Mm. Um, I had stress that I didn't think was stress. And I will never forget Dr. Nasha saying, just because you love your job doesn't mean mm. it's not killing you. Right. And so really, I had to learn how to say no and uh, really channel a lot more energy into spending time on myself. Mm. If I'm not charging my own batteries, I can't help other people. And then segueing right into that is I was a sleep mess. Um, I was going to bed late. I was getting up late. My circadian rhythms were totally backwards. Um, you know, working late at night, too much screen time, blue light. As a result, my hormones were all backwards. My adrenals were totally tapped out from over-exercise. Um, my immune system was a mess. My neutrophil lymphocyte ratio was like, completely backwards. Mm. My microbiome was a disaster when I tested my microbiome. It basically said I was like, had tons of formicutes. So it looked like I was a 300 pound woman with diabetes. Mm. I had no diversity of gut flora. And it turned out I was taking the wrong probiotic to support my uh, gut health. So I now can know which I'm deficient in and take the correct ones or just eat lots of fermented foods because I'm a farmer. I ferment yeah, foods. Yeah. So um, I had Epstein Barr. I had the herpes virus. I had inflammation. I had mitochondrial damage. I had really bad genes. Um, ApoE34 was one of them. Um, so I have a real inability to process saturated fats. So I've had to switch to a diet of mostly mono unsaturated mm. fats because yeah. of my DNA. Um, inability to process lactose with my LCT gene. So I was doing the ketogenic diet with tons of dairy. So I had mm. to switch that up. I see that a lot with my clients. You know, we have to change every person's diet based on their genes mm. and what yep. their blood chemistry is telling us. And just because you have a certain gene doesn't necessarily mean it's expressing itself. It can be turned on or turned off. Right. as you know, with epigenetics. So it's really important to look at blood work and see if those genes are expressing themselves. For example, with ApoE3-4, if you have really, really high triglycerides and you're eating a very, very low-carb diet, that might mean that you're eating wrong types of fats for your genetics. Mm -hmm. That's an example. 
Um, environmental toxins, I have been unable to pinpoint where they're all coming from. I have mercury toxicity, even though I don't have any fillings. Um, lead, cadmium, strontium, uh, silver, boron, no idea where it's coming from. It's not in my water. But where I lived mom, 20 years Did your mom have amalgam fillings? Did she have silver fillings? She did, but I'm thinking it's airborne because mm. we're in southwestern Colorado, and I think it's coming from the power plants. Oh, yeah. Even though they're several hundred miles away. Right. And the heavy metals that showed up in my blood work are from where I lived, I have pinpointed 20 years ago. And wow. so these things bioaccumulate in our fat cells. Yeah. And I recently did the Great Plains Laboratory, the um, non-heavy metals test, looking at all Envirochem. the envirochemicals. Yeah. yeah. Off the charts. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I've been eating organic and really well for 15 years. So these were childhood exposures. Mm. And even though I do infrared sauna every day and I do charcoal and clay, these are very, very persistent chemicals and hard to get out of the body. Luckily, I tested negative for mold. Mm -hmm. um, then, of course, mental, emotional, I went through the ACE test. I think it's really important. A lot of people kind of avoid the stress and the mental, emotional part. Yeah. Everybody says, isn't it hard to do the diet? I found the diet to be mm -hmm. quite easy after the first year, but the mental, emotional stress component, woof. <laughs> You know, it really took getting multiple cortisol tests back to tell me, all right, Allison, you've got to address this. And it was amazing. My cortisol was like 22. If anybody knows how high that is at 8 a.m. cortisol. After four weeks of meditation class, it was down to 15. It was perfect. Mm. So, now, the ACE, <clears throat> that is a adverse childhood experiences, right? And exactly. a lot of times we suppress those things. Uh, Right, but they're in our subconscious, and they are playing a role with how we see the world. Right, so the way that people communicate yes. with us, um, you know, things that are happening oftentimes will trigger trigger certain stress responses that may be amplified because of experiences we have when we were young. Yeah, it's interesting, and a lot of times when we see cancers of the reproductive area for men mm -hmm. and women, yeah. those are often linked to some type of either. Mm -hmm perceived trauma or actual trauma or sexual abuse that happened yeah. and then you know cancers of the lung area can be grief related and mm. so there is all this very very scientific approach that dr nisha and myself use but then it's also really important to not miss some of these outliers that often can trigger you know we see this a lot like somebody can be in complete remission and maybe the death of a loved one and the stress just of going through that can trigger a reoccurrence. So the mm. mind is yeah. super powerful and we need to really pay attention. Yeah, absolutely. So critical. So let's talk about a ketogenic diet, ketosis. How can that, why can that be effective for many types of cancers? Well, it is amazing. I think we know a lot about the ketogenic diet, but really I think it's the tip of the iceberg of what we're finding out right now. I think the three main factors that I see, well, the first one is obviously blood sugar balance. I you know, had a pre-diabetic blood sugar um, level, which was not even flagged on my mm -hmm. regular blood tests. Um, because we consider high blood sugar to be the norm these days. Yeah. We also the reality, PCOS, which, which is uh, insulin resistance as well. Exactly. And my fasting insulin was very high as well. Yeah. Yeah. And it was surprising. You know, it, it actually, and you, I'm sure I've seen this, the more insulin resistant you are, the longer it takes for the ketogenic diet's yeah. effects to take place. So some people will see massive changes in a month one person might be just dealing with the keto flu in that month and won't see the changes in um, either how they're feeling or their scans for like six to eight months. Um, it takes time, um, but it really is a miracle that, you know, I ate poorly really for 48 years. And it, one year later, um, you know, my hemoglobin A1C was 4.9. Mm. You know, my fasting in insulin was 1.7. Um, you know, all my blood sugar numbers had normalized. Uh, the 
amazing thing about the ketogenic diet is we're seeing that it's anti-angiogenic. And so for people who don't know that, it's basically cellular signaling. Uh, cancer cells don't die, right? And so we want cancer cells to die, and we also don't want them to get connected to the vascular system in our body. So the IGF-1 pathway, the AKT signaling pathways, these are all, you know, out there, you know, for the chemists that are listening. Yeah. Um, but th we're seeing massive changes in the way the body is communicating to itself. It's also anti-inflammatory. NF-kappa B signaling is just mm -hmm. mind-blowing. If uh, doctors or researchers could even just package that one little component of the ketogenic diet, it would be the miracle drug that would change all miracle drugs. And the fact is food is medicine. You can do this just by changing your diet. Yeah, and NF-kappa beta is basically a cell signaling molecule that amplifies inflammation throughout the body. It's kind of like a siren in a sense going off in a city. So it just amplifies inflammation. We yes. know that cancer cells are secreting a lot of that. Right there, they're producing a lot of that NFKB and they create an environment that's basically like a, just an inflammatory spiral. And, uh, exactly. and that helps feed them. And that's also why you can see those high, once the cancer starts really growing fast, you can see those high sensitivity, C-reactive protein, ESR, LDH, all those markers elevated. Um, and as they go down, you know that you're having progress, right? That you're um, moving in the right direction. So that, that is really key. Yep. That's a great way of explaining that mm -hmm. because it is, I, I remember Dr. Thomas Seafried saying, no drug we know can do all these things. Yeah. And I mean, it, that it's pro-apoptotic, that it's anti-angiogenic mm -hmm. and the NF-kappa B, like that is a miracle. Yeah, And people want to package that into a drug instead of changing the way we eat. Mm-hmm. And yep. as a farmer growing and raising my own food, I really feel that like food is medicine. Yeah. And if, if we can source our food so that they're, the food is getting clean water, clean air, clean soil, and then that food is going into us, the difference in our blood work is just astounding. I, I mean, I even work with physicians that were never taught this in school and they go through my program, I teach them how to look at the blood work differently, teach them how to look at the genetics, and they watch their markers that have been stubborn, especially inflammatory markers, for years. Um, then suddenly they go away, and it's all yeah. from diet and lifestyle changes. Yep. And now, when you started on the ketogenic diet, as you were progressing, were you trying to get your glucose ketone index to one-to-one, -one, the way that Dr. Seyfried uh, discusses? Yes, yeah. so the glucose ketone index is a great way to monitor how you're doing. Um, I, in the beginning, I didn't really have, you know, because it was so long ago, we didn't have the tools that we have now, like chronometer, to yeah. track, you know, how many grams of carbs we're eating. My carbs were way too high in the beginning. My um, fats were way too low. Mm -hmm. And I see this a lot with my clients is if you, people go low carb, but they also go low fat. And so yeah. then what I see is the body is like, okay, I'm looking for carbs. I can't find any, but I'm looking for fat and I can't find any. And this is true for even over well, overweight clients because the body needs to change what it's looking for. So initially, even with heavier clients, I have them go high fat. So the body gets that really flashing red light that we're switching over to burning fat for fuel. Yeah. And I, in the beginning, had a really hard time with my GKI. Also, when um, we have glucose, um, sometimes people can see a short-term spike in glucose when they go ketogenic. And as the, that adipose tissue releases old stored hormones and toxins, we want all that stuff to come out. Yeah. The old glucose comes out. So we'll see that short-term spike. And then now my blood glucose is regularly probably somewhere between 50 and 70. If I eat a really good ketogenic meal, it will stay below 80. And my ketones hover somewhere between three and four. I've been in ketosis for wow. so long yeah. that my GKI generally 
And we changed the GKI. For me personally, I hover now because I'm out of like the critical phase. Mm -hmm. Have my GKI somewhere between one and two. And if anybody wants to practice doing this, there's a a great uh, calculator on the Keto Mojo site. You can just click yeah. on it and it shows you how to do it. You can input yeah. the numbers. It does yeah. all the math yeah, for you. Yeah. It's, it's your glucose, right? Divided by yeah. 18. Yes. Over your blood ketones, right? So your blood right. glucose, divide that by 18 over your blood ketones gives you your range. Now, typically nutritional ketosis is usually somewhere under four to one. But if you want to get into that really strong healing zone, like especially when you've got a brain tumor, your goal is to try to get that down under one. Below one, yeah. yes. And you know, different tumors are different. So we, a lot of times we'll look at the Keras uh, report or the foundation one report and see how glycolytic the tumor is. Yeah. And then depending on how glycolytic the tumor is, then we can set the proper targets for mm. GKI and also for chronometer. Because are, you seeing, every are, you single person certain, is different. are you seeing certain trends there, certain tumors being more glycolytic than others? Oh, yes, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Which ones, you which know, ones brain, tumors, yeah. brain tumors, brain tumors, pancreatic cancer yeah. tend to be really glycolytic. But then, you know, you look at something like breast cancer, there's mm -hmm. so many different varieties. Mm. Um, like the difference between a BRAF mutation and a KRAF mutation, one's going to be more glycolytic than the other. So it's really good to really encourage your doctor to pay for, run for, code for um, these more extensive tests so you know exactly what you're dealing with. The other cool thing about looking at those tests is you can find out if the tumor cells are being driven by other things. Um, for example, glutamine is a huge driver for yeah. a lot of people. For my type of tumor, the glutamine levels were not um, Actually, it was a glutamine hog, but then when I tested my organic acid test, my glutamine was very low. So we knew that glutamine was not a particular player for me, even though it was a player for that particular tumor. Okay. Also, arginine and methionine can also be players. And this is why a lot of people get confused when they hear, well, like keto's good for one kind and not good for the other. The truth of it is, if you look on PubMed, um, I think most of the studies say, you know, 95% of all tumors have some type of glycolytic pathway. Yeah. Right. And that is confusing for people because the glycolytic pathway isn't the same for every tumor. Yeah. But it is yeah. involved. Um, but a lot of people get hung up on also that tumors are driven by inherited traits. Mm. Whereas it's somewhere between four to six percent is an inherited trait. But like, for example, BRCA gene, what we see a lot with BRCA gene is there's actually usually an underlying problem, which is an ESR2 mutation, which is the inability to process toxins and other mm. um, dioxin, things like that. So there's usually, I like to look at the deepest underlying cause. You know, how do you process grains? How do you process sugars? How do you process carbs? How do you process caffeine? How do you process different types of fats? Um, how is your detoxification pathways? How are, your, how are your estrogen pathways? Are you hoarding estrogen or are you purging it? You know, it's so yeah. fascinating now. We can yeah, there's we so have much. the future of medicine, I feel. And we're learning every day. That's the exciting part. Yeah, there's so much. Like you were saying, most cancer is not just some sort of genetic mutation and that's it. There's really a big epigenetic or environmental uh, factor that plays in with it. Like BRCA is a tumor suppressor gene, but your body has multiple different tumor suppressing genes. And it's not like there's just one system to suppress tumor growth. And uh, we just got to make sure all the systems are working well. And yeah. so, um, so I'm surprised. So what's amazing is that you're keeping your ketones around three to four. Now, are you doing, are you doing fasting, intermittent fasting? Um, Cause I find that to be tough unless I'm doing intermittent fasting. Uh, usually my ketone levels eating two meals a day and even one meal I do twice a week usually are somewhere between one and two. Um, yeah. And so are you, you eating things like, a, a, you know, 
above ground vegetables like broccoli, cauliflower. Yeah, yeah asparagus, stuff like that. Tomatoes, yeah. asparagus, yeah. things like that. So depending on people's cancer, like if I have yeah. someone that maybe with a low grade breast cancer, and then the Keras report comes back or, and says, you know, this isn't a heavy sugar feeder, um, we might look for ketones between one and three. And that's yeah. perfectly mm -hmm. great right. for that kind of situation. Then we could have another person with breast cancer that it is stage four and aggressive and maybe even metastatic. Then that person's going to need to be pushing their ketones you know, up well, to three or four, because we really want to get that NF kappa B signaling going. We want to make sure that there's no glycolytic pathways being enhanced there. Um, but again, you know, diet is the tip of the iceberg. If you do the ketogenic diet and you don't know your DNA, let's most ketogenic diets that people come to me are eating tons and tons of meat. They're not sourcing their meat from the correct places. Mm -hmm. um, it's conventional meat, yeah. they're having conventional dairy, they're not having nine cups of vegetables a day, and the quality of their fats, they might be in plastic bottles or they might not be cold pressed. So I call all that like kind of internet keto. Yeah, dirty keto. Dirty keto, yeah. yes. So what I'm a working of, on is a clean lot of environmental keto. chemicals that are coming in and when, yeah. you're, when you're getting conventional meats. And like you said, yeah. plastic bottles, right, with oil, which is leaching out BPA and phthalates and all those things are, are toxins and they drive inflammation in your body. Yes, and it is in my case um, and for a lot of my clients that are trying to get their ketones high, we have to stick to the nine cups of vegetables that are mostly in the leafy category. Yeah. Now I have become an expert at turning those leaves into pretty much every single one of my favorite foods. Yeah. I couldn't really find recipes that would enable me to make bread or fat bombs or chocolate mm -hmm. cake or waffles, pasta, things like that, that would enable my ketones to be three. So I basically wrote a cookbook, you yeah. know, because I had to come up with recipes that would meet my high levels of yeah. ketosis. So what are you typically eating on a regular basis? What, what's uh, what's Lots of chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I will, we were talking about fasting. Yes, I'm a yeah. big fan of time-restricted eating window. Mm -hmm. uh, so I will generally fast in the morning, uh, just have herbal tea, and I will eat my first meal somewhere between one and two. Um, this morning I had a, vegetable frittata, eggs from our chickens right mm -hmm. here. So I know exactly that those eggs are soy free yeah. and corn free. And then I pack so many green vegetables into that frittata that the frittata turns out green. Frittata is green. Oh. It's delicious. Yeah. And I have probably about a cup of um, bacon fat in there. Yeah. Um, because frittata, that's a great way to absorb uh, mm. fats um, in a frittata because um, things can come out greasy if you're trying to mm. And, and we'll talk about that. And one of my tricks is deep frying more things mm. because then you go from sauteing, which is like mushy to crispy, like fish sticks or fried chicken or chicken fried steak, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, so for, I'm making a pulled beef tonight for dinner mm -hmm. and have, I usually have a salad that's like, you know, bigger than the size of my shoulders practically. Yeah. Um, with tons of homemade salad dressing. Another one of my big tricks is to uh, puree herbs into my salad dressing, about two cups of herbs. So that's another way to sneak in. I'm always trying to figure out how can I sneak in the vegetables. So I make these really, this amazing um, Life by Chocolate brownie that I invented. Mm -hmm. And I'll puree mint into that or basil so that I'm getting good yeah. fats. I'm getting good organic chocolate, but I'm also getting some vegetables in there. And uh, I have an ice cream recipe because I can't have dairy because of my genetics. So I've invented a coffee creamer and an ice cream recipe that doesn't have coconut in it because coconut is canned, can't yeah. do canned vegetables, mm. yep. canned coconut milk. Um, so I had to invent a new ice cream and popsicle recipe as well. And so you're avoiding canned because of possible aluminum moving out well, of Well, they're all cans are lined with... BPA, BPA, and then when it says BPA free, yeah. here's the kicker: they use BPS. Right. 
So and BPA BPS, is only one of many different phthalates. One of many chemicals. You cannot find a can that yeah. isn't lined in plastic. Yeah. And plastic yeah. is pure evil. They have not found any plastic that does not leach into our system. It is a known endocrine disruptor for mm -hmm. fancy speak for those out there. You know, it's going to disrupt your thyroid. Um, you know, my polycystic ovarian disease and my breast fibroids were basically from an estrogen imbalance in my body. And so when I eliminated foods and plastic water bottles and Teflon pans and, you know, things that contributed to the too much estrogen in my body, yeah, all those things went away. Yeah. Those things can also drive insulin resistance too. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yep. So definitely big factors. That's why I got my glass water bottle, right? Oh my gosh, look. <laughs> hey, hey, there you go. Exactly. I drink. The only time, the only time I ever drink out of plastic bottles is when I'm flying, if I need something to drink. And oftentimes I'll try to do a dry fast when I'm, when I am traveling yeah. uh, until, you know, just as long as I can, at least um, just because, yeah, obviously if I want to reduce my exposure to the plastic. Yeah. I have a nifty little water filter and I make yeah. the flight attendant give me a full bottle of water and then I pour that into oh, my water filter go. and then I pour it into this and my husband just goes crazy because I've got like <laughs> all these bottles and filters Smart. and chocolate and my keto bread and my brownies. And it, you're so right. When I travel now, it's like, I'm just going to fast. It's so yeah, much exactly. easier. You know, to me, it's one of those things where fasting is, is a hormetic stressor on you. And I try to really focus on, you know, traveling can be stressful in general. And uh, so I try to focus doing a lot more intentional breathing when I'm, when I'm traveling and I don't eat or drink or at least drink very little. Right. And I just fo try to focus on breathing. It's like, I don't usually do that at home. I'm not at home. I hydrate as much as I want. Right. And so, right. um, but it's like, uh, it's, it's kind of introducing a little bit of a new element of stress by going four or five hours without during the day without water for me is stressful, but I, yeah, every time I'm thirsty, I just go back to doing some breathing practices, breathing exercises, and it just calms that thirst. I feel less stress. I feel relaxed. Right. It's been really helpful. Yeah. And yeah. I also do one longer fast mm. every month. Yeah. And By a longer I know fast. I've seen three a lot days, of posts that you have showed, yeah. you know, that three to five day fast. I mm -hmm. remember many years ago when I, I finally was like, okay, I'm going to do this. I, I think I've secretly been, I, I'm addicted to food. I love, you know, yeah. I went from someone who, I think we all are. Cook. You know? I, I hated to cook. I was a carboholic. Yeah. I was a vegetarian carboholic. Yeah. I had to go learn how to cook and now I'm in love with yeah. food. It's a, it's a way to de-stress myself, chopping and slicing and dicing. Totally. And so I didn't really want to do the fasting three to five yeah. days a month, Yeah. but I had a little reoccurrence in 2018. And mm. so I had to figure out how to get the heavy metals out of my body at an accelerated rate. At that point I bought an infrared sauna um, do the clay and the charcoal. And I started doing the three to five days a month. I could not believe it. I tested my labs the day before my first fast. And then I tested them seven days later. The shift, I remember reading on your post, you talked about how it boosts your immune system. Absolutely. Well, I had to really see it to believe it. My neutrophil lymphocyte ratio just absolutely went from like eh, eh, to like stellar in yeah. seven days. Yeah. Like how can that happen? Yeah. Your body, your body sprouts all those new, uh, stem cells. So you get actual white blood cells, stem cells, mm -hmm. um, healthy cells near and due to the toxicity, the stress, things like that, your white blood cell load was really, you know, your, your, your cells were, uh, old and, and dysfunctional. Exactly. Right? And so you're able to get rid of those and sprout new ones. Yeah, and stubborn things like hemoglobin A1C, people who have a really hard time busting that. Yeah. They'll do one fast. I, you know, I saw one person recently, she had a 5.6, she was eating ketones up at three. Yeah. Did her first four day fast, but went down to 4.9 in, in just a matter of days. Absolutely amazing. Same yeah. with the stubborn IGF-1, which is, you know, something we know is a big problem with cancer. 
Yeah. Um, that can really shift um, with sleep yeah. changes, stress changes, and the fasting is just sometimes the icing on the cake on that one. Yeah, this is powerful. It's a lot of the stuff that I teach. You know, you're doing a lot of really good plant foods that help your liver and your bile ducts. And I see that being a big issue yeah. for a lot of people when they go keto is that their body's really bad at producing bile and they can't emulsify mm -hmm. and break down fats. And that's where right. a lot of those greens come in, those bitter herbs, you're getting a lot of herbs and the salad dressings you're making, yeah. right? And all those things are just so important to get the bile flowing. Get the bile flowing, it's gonna really help exactly. with uh, burning fat and also sterilizing your small intestine, right? Because you see a lot of people with overgrowth of bacteria. Right yeast and things like that in their small intestine that will really help so yeah. yeah my my yeast problem just went away I never yeah. I never really did anything about it other than a therapeutic ketogenic diet yep yeah and it's exactly powerful yeah powerful powerful medicine and I really think we need to spread the message about this clean keto yep. how to do it with a real abundance of plant plants small amounts of really quality proteins yeah Definitely. Pretty definitely. large amounts of good quality fats. Yeah. Um, but really trying ratios? to diverse it. Yeah. What are the typical ratios you like to stay on for yourself? And what are you typically doing for, obviously you're looking at genes, so you're kind of customizing it a little yeah. bit, those macros. But what are you typically seeing is working really well as far as the macros? You know, I would say the average person comes to me and just like myself with the hemoglobin A1C of 5.8, high yeah. fasting insulin, high IGF-1. Um, either really high cortisol or really low cortisol, but mm -hmm. all indicating that there's quite a big problem going on there. And in that case, you know, depending on all their scans and their health history and their other markers, most people I put on to start with is an 85% fat, 5% um, mm, okay. yep. carb and 10% protein. And that's what I've developed all my re recipes around. Like how do you eat a piece of keto bread and still maintain that recipe? Yeah, uh, that, that ratio and same with my ice cream and same with, you know, my pasta recipes. How do you keep it at 85, 5, 10? That's a challenge. Um, now, low protein is important for cancer because in a lot of cancer cases, you have this mTOR pathway, which is a building pathway in the body. It's a pathway that exactly. children have elevated because they're growing and building and developing. If you're trying to really build muscle tissue, you want to elevate it. But what happens is it can become hyperactive. And with cancer patients, you don't want to be constantly growing and building. You want to be doing a lot of cleaning and repairing. Exactly. And um, you got to suppress that. And we know carbs, insulin, and also amino acids drive that. And so that's exactly. why you're bringing that protein down. Because I typically at this point in my life, I follow more of like a 25 to 30% protein in my diet, more like 60, 65% fat. And I, I feel like I thrive on that. But yeah, if I had cancer, right? And when I did have skin you cancer, have to. I dialed that down. Exactly. Exactly. Yep. And my husband is on, you know, a, probably about the same ratio that you're mm -hmm. on. And then again, you know, if I have someone that is like, uh, let's say a low grade prostate cancer, um, you know, they probably could be on a 75% fat, um, yeah. but then we would it's change up growing cancer. We yeah. would change up the protein in that case because mm -hmm. prostate cancer can be driven by methionine. Yeah. So, a so you would want to limit foods that are high in methionine. And so that's, what's so cool about what we can find out. Yeah. With testing. Most of your muscle things. meats, most of your muscle meats are higher in methionine. Whereas exactly. like a collagen protein, which is high in glycine, but it's lower in methionine, lower in branched chain amino acids, right. things like that. So you do more of that. Um, what other what other sources for that person that are low in methionine? Um, if they have a cancer that's driven by methionine. Yeah. What are the low yeah. methionine? I know collagen peptides or collagen protein. You no, know, we're really trying to avoid. Um, if they have a methionine driven cancer is you would be off eggs for a while. Yeah. Eggs are high in methionine. Eggs are really high in methionine. I believe, um, trying to remember if, I think it's, uh, there it's Turkey thigh. I think it, mm. there's like the thigh has more methionine than the breast, or I might have that mm, backwards. Interesting. Um, yeah. There's some, you can pull up on the internet, like methionine rich foods. And, yeah. uh, there's some, I actually, the list is so long that I actually store it on my computer. And then if I have 
a client that has a methionine driven cancer, I'm just going to send them that list. Mm. I have like probably a thousand different lists for yeah. people. So like if someone has, you know, an oxalate issue or a mm. migraine issue, I have lists of foods that can be those triggers. Yeah. But you know, a lot of times these issues are related to leaky gut. And if you yeah. can heal the leaky gut, then oftentimes most of these foods aren't real food allergies. Um, they are the fact that the foods are leaking into the peritoneal cavity. And when they're leaking into the peritoneal cavity, people are having an allergic reaction to whatever they ate. It's not that they're allergic to that food. Mm. And yep. so, so we do, I do look at DNA. Like I have, I was born with the inability to process lactose. I had not one symptom of having problems with lactose. I was making my pizza crusts with cheese. I was putting cheese on top of my pizza. Um, everything, you know, the keto, uh, internet keto or dirty keto is all yeah. cheese. Right. And right, exactly. it wasn't until I had a reoccurrence in 2018 that I was like, okay, I need to meditate more. Um, I need to get the heavy metals out of my body and I need to finally quit dairy. And mm. dairy has this <laughs> dopamine reaction. It has this incredible oh, yeah. feel good reaction like caffeine. <clears throat> it's addictive. Um, but nope. I tell you now, I've been off of it for several years. I don't miss it really that much. Yeah. And so let's, um, let's talk a little bit about some of the supplements that you used. You mentioned doing heavy metal detoxification. Right. So what are the supplements that you've rotated through your regimen with? Well, for inflammation, I'm dealing with, um, and this is true for, particularly for brain cancer, is Boswellia. Yeah. Um, it is a lot of doctors put brain cancer patients on steroids, which mm -hmm. drive up um, your blood sugars, which can in the long term feed cancer. So it's a lot of times uh, Dr. Nisha is getting people off of steroids and onto a high dose Boswellia, depending on what type of brain cancer mm. they have. Um, Dealing with certain things, like if people have elevated galactin-3, then we might have, have them on a modified citrus pectin to pull down galactin-3. Um, have almost everybody on magnesium. I mean, I know you know yeah. uh, that yeah. magnesium yeah. is like the master everything. Um, it, everything from genes to immune system to sleep, you know, the list is long. I will never be off magnesium, and probably none of us on this planet should be off yeah. magnesium because we basically don't have it in our soil and our water anymore. Right. And so I'm and a big The more fan. stress you're under, the more you use it. So it's like, kind of exactly. like going into a car. The more you use it, the more stress we're under, the more we're going to use up that magnesium. Exactly. Vitamin D3, that's just, yeah. I was born um, with the SNP uh, that doesn't mm -hmm. allow vitamin D3 to get into the cell. So I have to kind of mega dose with vitamin D3 to get it into my cell, into my cells. Um, B vitamins, um, all my genetics show that I'm a really poor metabolizer of B6, B12, um, B2, and then I'm also on 5-methylfolate. Mm -hmm. But again, a lot of these, we're always just tailoring to people's genetics. Yep. We're looking at their genetics. We're saying, okay, like for example, um, if they have several genes that show that they're going to possibly be low in B12, then we're going to jump over to their labs and see how their MCB, yeah. their MCH, their MCHC is, yeah. and if it is actually expressing itself as yeah. a B12 deficiency. Yeah, because B12, folate's also in this, and B6, they play a big role in the maturation of the red blood cell. So normally that red blood cell matures in the bone marrow and gets to an optimal size. And if you don't have enough of these nutrients, and B12s are the biggest player in it, um, you don't, they don't mature well and they're larger. And you see that when you look at your blood work and it says MCV, MCHC, those numbers are higher. Like I think the ideal zone is somewhere around 85 to 92 for your MCV. And if mm -hmm. it's higher than that, it's a sign you're not maturing those red blood cells real well. And there's a number of factors for why that could be, but uh, certainly exactly. could be a could be a major factor with that. Are you looking at methylmalonic acid? You do yes. that? Yep. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, and I think mistakenly people look at serum B12 and get misled yeah. because sometimes high serum B12 means 
the B12 isn't getting into the cells. So right. a lot of people quit their B12 supplement when they see high mm -hmm. serum B12. Yeah. And it's, it's tricky. You know? Yeah, and high serum B12 really is never a problem because it's water soluble, so your body will get rid of it. Exactly. But if you don't get enough B12 into the cell, that's a big problem. What do you, what do, you do? Do you use lithium, like lithium orotate, to help get it into the cell or... Are you using I don't um, personally. Sometimes Dr. Yeah. Nisha will see, you know, she is just a mastermind. If yeah. we have like a really tricky case um, with somebody, but we're really focusing on the fat soluble vitamins that A, mm -hmm. uh, e, uh, A, e, uh, sorry, A, D, and K yeah. um, is being the most critical in the beginning right. for people. Mm. Um, because also you're on so many things that are helping fight the cancer that sometimes the supplement list can be long. like yeah. really intolerable. Right. Um, for me personally, and for 95% of my clients, we test positive for Epstein-Barr. So yeah. fighting, um, viruses, um, you know, because if you have a viral load in your body and your body is just fighting that virus 24 seven, mm -hmm. it has an inability to go out and attack and gobble up those cancer cells. Right. Yep. So what do you see, I, what do you see in that? What, what are some things that you're using for Epstein Barr? You know, right now, currently we're using lysine. Yeah. Um, Supplemental lysine. Right. But yep. L lysine. L -lysine. Um, emulsified vitamin A. Yep. And uh, monolaurin. Okay, monolaurin, yep. 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 So those are the three that we're mm -hmm. using, and I currently, um, yep. it, it is hard because, like, I finally beat mine. I was on them for like six months. And then, you know, probably my husband took a sip of someone's water bottle, and then I kissed my husband, and then boom, it, it was back again. Mm. Yeah. So it is critical if you have it um, is to treat your yourself, but also your kids and your husband, anybody that, and, you know, I think the one good thing about the current viral situation is people yeah. are becoming a lot more aware of mm. sharing water bottles, chapsticks yeah. and yeah. things like that. We need to be hyper vigilant about that. Uh, you know, a lot of cancers can have a very strong viral component, especially cancers up here and then cancers down at the other end. Yeah. So, and what do, what do you think of like vitamin C, zinc, uh, astragalus, right? As far as antiviral properties to them, things like yeah, that. It all depends on the person mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah. If we see like a low free T3 on the thyroid, if it's yeah, under three, yeah. um, then we're looking at selenium, um, if Selenium. copper is above 90 or if ceruloplasm is above 20, then, you know, we'd be looking at zinc, but we'd also look at someone's fingernails, see if they've got any other white spots on there. And then also look at their genetics and see if they're going to need a higher dose of zinc. Um, yep. but the zinc copper relationship is very, very important for cancer mm -hmm. yep. for sure. Yeah, absolutely. I've seen zinc be very helpful for a lot of people. Um, let's talk about other therapies. Did you do hyperbaric oxygen? Yeah. Which I know can be very good for brain cancer, especially just flooding the system with oxygen. We know oxygen is therapeutic for healthy cells, but toxic for cancer cells because cancer cells are anaerobic. So they produce basically all their energy from glycolysis. Um, and they can't burn fat. And that's one of the reasons why we try to get that blood sugar down because most cancer cells struggle to use fat or ketones for energy. They're very good at using glucose and they also are not able to produce energy with oxygen. And oxygen actually can flood in there and, and cause you know, major free radical damage to cancer cells. So did you use hyperbaric oxygen therapy? I did. And almost all of uh, our clients that are dealing with brain cancers, um, usually uh, their molecular profiling back and it looks good for having them do mm. um, hyperbaric oxygen. Again, it's always a case by case yeah. basis. Um, and then for people, cancers from the neck down, you know, we're looking at treatments like hyperthermia. Um, yeah. Cancer really doesn't like heat. Mm. Um, that would be like sometimes sauna. For example, yeah. one, infrared one. sauna, if people come back with high heavy metals or high other chemicals in their body, you know, you're looking at detoxification, 
you know, the list of treatments is so um, individualized for people. And a lot of what I really like about what Dr. Nisha does is that she is combining sometimes we need conventional treatments if people's DNA comes out properly in combination with an integrative treatment mm. um, and has a really yeah. good success rate. Um, yeah. But then some people's DNA comes back and the tumor would basically um, is chemo insensitive or also uh, radiation can only be used really effectively if the tumor um, has oxygen. If the tumor is hypoxic, it's gonna have a really hard time um, having radiation be effective. So there's mm. a lot of these things that doctors aren't even checking. Right. Um, they won't see if the cancer cell is to, uh, chemo resistant. Um, they won't see if the tumor cell is hypoxic or not. Um, you know, this is all, I let Dr. Nisha do the customized treatments and I do kind of the customized diet and lifestyle. But for me, you know, the hyperbaric oxygen was incredibly powerful. I noticed some incredible things happen to my body and especially my gut health. I was pretty surprised um, that I saw my gut health change. I hadn't been able to drink coffee for 25 years and I came out of hyperbaric um, uh, with a lot poorer and uh with the ability to drink coffee i think it was worth it <laughs> <laughs> yeah because you do have to pay for it right so uh well so in certain did you, cases did you, get, did you uh rent one or did you get one in your house or i would actually drive over towards aspen mm. from where yeah. i live um to go to a private one because it was a yeah. lot cheaper right um but if people have had radiation in the past from a previous treatment you can actually get hyperbaric mm. covered um uh, because they use it for mitochondrial repair. Right. Yeah. So it's it's really cool if anybody gets a chance to listen to the talks from Dr. Scott Sher. Um, mm. He's just brilliant. You know, it, it kills bugs. It regenerates oh. vasculature. Um, I mean, they're using it successfully for Lyme disease, for traumatic brain injury, for concussions. Um, yeah, it's powerful. It's powerful stuff. I met a guy at a conference. I was speaking on cancer, and he was speaking on traumatic brain injury. He got it was a martial artist, and he got kicked in the head. Mm. Had a huge lesion in his brain, and hyperbaric oxygen and the ketogenic diet. Voila! Yeah, amazing. there you go. It's a phenomenal, phenomenal combination, right? Because getting really just getting your body to run off of ketones getting the oxygen in there and supporting my, mitochondrial biogenesis uh, is life-changing, yeah. right? And especially the brain, because we know that the brain has 10,000 mitochondria per cell. Your muscle right. cells have about 1,000. Your heart has 5,000. So the more mitochondria you have, the, more, the greater the effect oxygen and ketones are going to have on that particular uh, system, right? That particular organ of the body. So brain, you know, that's really why at this point in my life, I follow a ketogenic diet just for performance, right? My, my yes. brain is alive, right? And I, feel I mean, I would never go back. I always yeah. say, you know, I, I mean, I did the ketogenic diet for cancer, but yep. I feel incredible. And like all those things that I was telling you about that were, that I considered normal happening to my body, that they've all gone away. I would never change it for the world. And, you know, plus I get to eat brownies and ice cream every day and not feel bad go. about it. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. That's keto brownies, part. keto ice cream. You got yeah, it. Yeah, it's the Sounds best. Great. Sounds great. So uh, last question. What are your top five favorite keto foods, Allison? Oh, well, people can go to my website, allisongannett.com. You can download... Yeah. My favorite recipes are all on there and they're free. So yep. go get those. Those are my Life by Chocolate brownies. Couldn't live without it. My dairy-free ice cream. Couldn't live without it. My um, bread recipe that I've invented that also makes pancakes or waffles. I couldn't live without that. Um, I really actually have become a bit of a, vegetar a, a vegetarian, a, veg a vegetable liker. Yeah, um, I, I never really loved them before, and now I, I, I really miss pasta for the first couple of years. But now that I can make pasta out of just about any vegetable known to mankind, and that I know how to make such a rich sauce with so much fat in it, like I cook like the French do, you know, <laughs> mm, yummy. Um, 
And I, you know, I love simple things like salads with a really good salad dressing and um, a really good hamburger. We raise cows, so our meat is just nice. amazing, you know. I don't, I could go on and on. I love food. <laughs> <laughs> we could have a whole episode That's just right, talking about what right. I grow in my garden and what I make yeah. out of it. Well, I love that you're doing that. And I just want to acknowledge you for being an inspiration, obviously an inspirational healing journey. And, you know, you didn't keep it to yourself that you're out there actually spreading the message, helping people one-on-one -on, -one on a regular basis. You also have a great guys. You got to check out her 28 day DIY program too. Uh, so you can check that out as well. AllisonGannett.com. And, um, you know, just being, being so energetic and such a beacon of hope for people. And you dove into the science. Um, you've got a great mentor there with Dr. Nasha, and you're just helping people all around the world. And so I just want to acknowledge you for that and uh, let you know that you're a hero to many. So, uh, well, you're my hero. I, I love your posts. I just, you know, I love that you're spreading the message out there. And I think together, you know, the medical industry is never going to want to embrace that we can use food as medicine. Mm, yeah. But we, as the people that are really taking charge of our health and spreading the message worldwide that you don't have to be a victim and mm. that you can grow old gracefully and happily and yeah. have a quality of life that's like higher than you ever thought. I mean, I never thought that cancer would be a gift, but I really, it's to the gift. bottom of my heart, you know, it has changed my life for the better. Mm. And I hope people, I know that sounds cliche and silly if you're out there and you're miserable and you just got diagnosed, but there's hope out there. You can change your life too. And listen to the doc here. He's got all the science. Your website is fantastic. Your posts are fantastic. Well, thank you, Allison. And again, thank you for your inspiration, for uh, for your life and what you're doing, your life's work. So guys, check out our website, allisongannett.com. We'll have all the info in the show notes. And remember, you're more valuable than you think you are. So start taking action. You learned a lot today. Start putting that in action. I know that you're going to see life transforming results. Be blessed, guys. We'll see you on the future podcast.